Hello Angular fans, my name is Matt Rabel. Today I'd like to show you how to deploy an Angular application to Heroku, Firebase, Netlify, and S3. Let's get started. This screencast is based on a blog post that I wrote called Angular Deployment with a Side of Spring Boot. Angular and Spring Boot are two of the most popular combinations to use when deploying modern web applications. You'll often find that people deploy them as either separate artifacts or one specific artifact where the Angular app is inside of Spring Boot. Today I'm going to show you how to deploy them as separate artifacts. In the future I'll show you how to combine them in a single jar and deploy them using Docker. At the bottom of this blog post is a GitHub repo. There's a link to it right here. I have that open in this tab. And within here, I have a demo.adoc file. Adoc for ASCII doc. And it's just a format that I like to use instead of Markdown. And in this file, I have a number of demo steps. These demo steps will show you how to deploy everything that we're doing today. I just condensed the blog post. If I click on the raw button, I can view it in ASCII doctor. I have an ASCII doctor plugin that allows me to toggle on and off. So you'll need Java 11, Node 12, Docker, and an Okta developer account to get started. The good news is Okta developer account we can actually create from Heroku, so you don't need to create that right now. If I were to open up a terminal and put that on the right, you can see I have Java 11, 12, and the latest version of Docker. So I'm going to put these steps on the left here, and then we'll make this a bit bigger. So these are the steps we'll go through. We'll prepare an Angular and Spring Boot application for deployment. We'll deploy it to Heroku. And then we'll deploy Angular to Heroku using uh, Heroku's build packs. And then we'll use Angular CLI's ng deploy to deploy it to all the other providers. And we're just going to use Spring Boot on Heroku for the back end for all the different providers. And I'll show you how that works. So we'll start by cloning the Angular Bootstrap example, which is the previous tutorial I wrote before this one. And then we'll go into there, and we can open it up in IntelliJ. So the first thing you'll need to do is create a Heroku account. If you go to heroku.com, id.heroku.com slash login, you can sign up for a new account or log into your existing one. I'm already logged in to mine, so I'll create a new app. We'll call it Beautiful Angular, and then make this a bit bigger. If we go to the Resources tab, we can add a new add-on called Okta. So this is a free add-on. It uses our developer plan, which is free for life. You get a thousand monthly active users for free. And we'll provision that. One thing you might want to be aware of is that to add Heroku add-ons, you do have to have a credit card in Heroku system. It's a form of security verification. So you can see over here, we have this little free toggle going, and now it's ready to go. If we were to click on settings, and reveal the configuration variables. You can see it's populated all of those. So back to our instructions, what I'm going to do is create an octa.env file in the notes API directory and copy the octa variables into it and paste that in there. And then if we go and grab those values, we have the issuer here. Okay, with just those values, we can actually start our service now. So if we were to do cd into notes API, source octa.env and run Cradle W boot run. You'll see it starts right up, and if we were to go to localhost, we can use these values that we have in here to log in. So grab that one. And we'll save that. And it'll prompt you for a security question. This is so you can do password recovery. So I can say, what is your favorite security question? This one. Now you'll notice it comes back to this page and it gives a 400 error. Well, that's kind of strange. You'll notice it's a 404. If you were to actually go to an endpoint that exists, then you'll get your data. So it's talking to an H2 database right now and everything seems to be working, including Okta for authentication. So now we'll need to uh, configure our client. But one thing I wanted to show you beforehand is that if you did want to run it directly from your IDE, you can just modify the Spring Boot demo application and go to the environments and copy and paste these environment variables in here. Of course, you'll need to remove the export here, but now you could run it directly from your IDE. So I can cancel this one and run it directly from here. And so in the Angular application, the Okta configuration is defined in auth 
routing module. So you see we have the issuer and the client ID here. So we'll grab that issuer, which is 605.309. So change that one. And then you want to use the client ID for the SPA. So we'll grab that value, put it right there. And then we can run the Angular application. First of all, we'll need to run npm install. So we'll do that from IntelliJ, or you could do it from the command line. Now that everything is installed for the client, we can go into that directory and run ng-serve. Then if we were to open up localhost 4200, I can click login. And it gives us an error here, so what's going on? Looks like it's trying to go to an old one, so let's go to application clear site data. Hopefully you won't have to do this because I'm using different Okta tenants, so my last one was still stuck in there. Now if we go to login, it all works and it comes back and you can view your notes. So if we were to go to view notes, create a new one and say first local note, yeehaw. That's saved in Spring Boot. So if we were to go back to our Spring Boot process, you can see that all working. So the next thing that I want to do is first of all, commit everything to Git. We'll go to the terminal here, go to the top level directory and commit everything. So we have our Okta OIDC configuration. And the next thing is preparing Spring Boot and Angular for production. So one of the first things that I like to do whenever I'm working on a new project or maybe updating an old one is update all its dependencies to the latest version. This gets you security updates and other goodness. So there's a couple plugins for Gradle you can use. Use latest versions plugin and the versions plugin to actually configure it to automatically update. And not so much automatically, but when you run a command, it'll update. This will upgrade from spring 2.2 to 2.3, and that requires a new version of Gradle. And so you do need to update Gradle before you do that using this command, which is Gradle wrapper, Gradle version, at least 6.3. I'm gonna do 6.5 since that's the latest one at the time of this writing or the time of the screencast, distribution type equals bin. And then we can run Gradle W, use latest versions. And you'll notice now we're using Spring Boot 2.3. If we were to look at the git difference, you'll see we've got that new version of Spring Boot. And uh, we got a new version of uh, Okta Spring Boot Starter as well. And we'll enable auto reload on our Gradle script. And now let's verify everything still works here. So it's all up and running. We can go to API notes, verify that we didn't break anything. That's still coming back and we're re-authenticated. So everything's working. Now for Angular, you can use NPM check updates, which is an NPM package that just upgrades your dependencies. So we can go ahead and install that. And then if you were to run NCU, it'll print out all of the current versions and their upgrades. You can see there's a whole bunch, uh, mostly Angular 9.0 to 9.1 and a number of other things. So you can use ncu-u to upgrade. And this will upgrade TypeScript from 3.75 to 3.95 and Angular 9 only works with 3.83. So you do need to downgrade TypeScript after running that. So if you go into your package.json, scroll down to the bottom, change it back to 3.8.3 .3, and then you can run npm install. So you'll see that resulted in 73 low severity vulnerabilities. Well, I personally don't like any vulnerabilities. So let's get rid of those with NPM audit fix. Okay, so you see it fixed 73 of 73, that's great. Let's run ng serve and make sure we didn't break anything. And once that's completed, log out and log back in to make sure this is all working. another new note another one new note all right so we didn't break anything that's great let's commit all those changes to get cd into the parent and update the dependencies to the latest version the next thing we'll need to do is configure production urls and this means various things one it means that Angular shouldn't hard code localhost 8080 as its API URL, and Spring Boot shouldn't hard code localhost 4200 as its allowed origins. There's also database URLs. In production, you're not gonna wanna use H2. You're gonna wanna use something more robust like Postgres. In demo application, that's where it hard codes localhost 4200. And in our Angular app, it's auth interceptor. 
and the note service. So let's start with the uh, demo application on the Spring Boot side of things. You'll notice it has localhost 4200 right here. So we're going to change it to use an allowed origins property. This will be read from a properties file or an environment variable. You'll need to import that value annotation. And then down here we'll change this localhost 4200 to use that property. And then in application.properties we specify allowed origins equals HTTP localhost 4200 and make sure and don't use HTTPS. I just did that out of habit, so that's good. It's good habits HTTPS. And then in the Angular app, there's environments. So they already have the concept of environments built in. This will be your development environment. This will be your production one. And the difference is when you run ng build dash dash prod, it uses production. When you're just doing regular ng serve, it uses development. So we're gonna add an API URL and we'll set that to localhost. And then for production, let's grab that. We'll use what we specified for Heroku, which is that beautiful. Now we'll change the auth interceptor, which is under app shared octa auth interceptor. Change this to use environment, and you'll need to import environment. Got to spell it right. There we are. And then in the note service as well, which is under note note service. So we'll start with uh, that first one, environment right here and import and then down in the user notes we need to use it there as well so we fixed all the urls we're no longer hard coding localhost and we can edit build.gradle next to basically switch between h2 and postgres so under this change this runtime only for h2 to look for a prod property being passed in and then we can add profile information so if the project has that prod passed in, then use prod profile else dev. And so when you're running boot run, we can say, hey, the, the profile that's activated for spring is either prod or dev. And then when it processes a resource, when it creates, it creates the jar, we want to take that dev or prod and make that application.properties, and that'll be the default. Another way to do it is actually keep them both in there and always have to specify the profile. But I like to make it so you don't have to specify the profile many with different ways to do it. And so now in application.properties, we'll rename that to application-dev. And we'll keep that allowed origins and we'll add a data source URL. And all this does is set it so H2 uses a file-based system instead of in memory. And so if you do restart the app, it actually keeps the data. If you refresh or delete all the uh, files, if you run Gradle clean, then your data will be gone, of course. And then one thing we can do to test Postgres is use Docker Compose. So if you go to source main Docker, create a new file here called Docker PostgreSQL YAML. We'll go ahead and add it to Git. Paste that in there. And that uses Postgres 12. And then we'll have this application prod that uses Postgres by default. You'll see that still allows 4200. Uses auto update so it creates a schema and uses that data source URL for Postgres. One thing that happens when you do this is user is a keyword in Postgres. So if I tried to start it right now, it actually wouldn't work. We have to go and change from using user to username. So I'll do that in my entity first and that changes everything all the way from there up. For instance, all my JPA queries need to change, right? Find all by username now instead of user. So that's in the REST repository. And then for setting a username on a new note, and then in data initializer to make a similar change there. And then in our user controller, find all by user name. So that's all you need to do to change from user to username. And then for the data initializer, let's make it so this only initializes in development. And now we can test these profiles using Docker Compose. So we can go into the notes API directory and run Docker Compose, source main Docker. That starts it up. It's ready to accept connections. We can go ahead and source octadev first. I'm going to kill 8080 just in case something's running there. So source octadev, wrong directory. And run 
run gradle boot run dash pprot. So now we're connected to Postgres. To prove that, we can go ahead and refresh our notes. Oh, that's not running, so ng serve. So you can see that worked. If we look back at our run, oh, not that one in our terminal here, you can see it entered it in. So that's working. We're talking to Postgres and we have those different profiles configured. So now we'll commit that code to git. Git commit. All right, now let's deploy Spring Boot to Heroku. So you'll need the Heroku CLI to get started. I already have it, so Heroku login. If you don't have it, just go to this Dev Center articles Heroku CLI there and we'll start by uh, mentioning that usually Heroku has you have one application and one github repo but they do have a mono repo build packs plugin that allows you to specify that hey this directory goes to this app this directory goes to this app so that's what I'm going to be using um, so we'll start by uh, looks like it wants me to open up a browser to log into Heroku so we'll start by specifying the app name and configuring this app to use that existing Bootiful Angular one we created. So I'm just gonna do an export app name equals Bootiful Angular. And then I'm gonna say Heroku get remote is that app name. So now if you see we have the origin, right? That's the one we cloned from and then Heroku has a Bootiful Angular one as well. So then we can run these commands. First of all, set the app base to be that notes API directory. And then we'll add the mono repo build pack as well as Heroku's Gradle build pack. And then we'll add Postgres as an add-on. And then by default, Gradle build pack uses Gradle build and doesn't run the tests, but we wanted to use Gradle W boot jar and pass in prod. So we can set the Gradle task variable to be boot jar dash prod. There's variables that Okta created. If we look at Heroku config edit, we can see all those variables. And by default, the Okta Spring Boot starter expects a client ID, a client secret, and an issuer. And you'll notice these variables have an web on the end. So I'm just gonna modify those. And this will allow it to override what Spring Boot starter expects for Okta and then we'll do control X and yes and yes and I'll update that configuration and then we're ready to deploy so we can run git push Heroku master so now you can run Heroku open or you can just click on those links and open them in your browser so we're actually logged in at this point if we were to expand this out a little and go to API notes you can see that there are no notes, but we are logged in, otherwise it would redirect us to Okta. And so if we go back to here, this is a 404 because we have nothing to find at the root. So let's fix that. Let's create a root home controller. And so you might have noticed I just typed a couple characters and boom, it spits out all this code. Those are IntelliJ Live templates. And if you were to scroll up to the top here, I have a link to the ones that I use. So these are all in GitHub and you can import my live templates into your project and create a similar demo to mine. So I added that home controller and now we can commit that and then git push Heroku to the main branch. So then that's completed. Let's see if uh, that worked. So that's taking a little while to load. Let's look at the logs. Roku logs tail. And you'll see right as I did that, it starts up. So that's how you can see the logs going. It did take a little while. I've noticed if you just do a brand new start, it only takes like 10 seconds, but a restart can take a, a little while there. So now it says hello, you know, to the full name from the user. So uh, that's all working. We have Spring Boot running on Heroku. Now let's work on Angular. We'll start by creating a new application for Angular. So Heroku create, clear out our terminal here, Heroku apps. So this afternoon woodland 21849, we'll set that as a uh, app name. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and configure the base to be notes for that. And then uh, the mono repo, and we'll add node.js as the two build packs. And then we'll need something to run 
the actual Angular app. So we can use HTTP server spa for that. So in package.json, we can change this start script uses HTTP server spa. And then there's a special Heroku post build script we can use to do the Angular build, right? ng build dash dash prod and install HTTP server spa. And so I'll go ahead and commit that code and then we'll add the new git remote, we'll call it angular, and then git push angular master. When that completes, you can run Heroku open, specify that angular is the remote. And if we were to try to log in here, you'll get a 400 error. And this is a common error that developers see, and I don't blame them for being confused because it says the redirect URI parameter must be an absolute URI. But it doesn't really tell you what the URI parameter is. But if you look in the URL, way up here, it actually has it, right? So the redirect URI is at afternoon woodland slash callback. So if we were to go back to our app just to get that URL, we need to add it to the spa that Heroku creates. So if we were to log in via that resources octatab, we can go to applications and then to the spa app and click on general and edit and then add that URI as a allowed origin. Now if we were to go back to notes here, try again, now we're in. And if we wanted to view our notes, we could say, hey, first Heroku note. Yes. Oh, there's an error there. And if we were to look at our console, we'll see that the page at Afternoon Woodlands was loaded over HTTPS, but it tried to make a request to Bootiful Angular, which is on HTTP. So I messed that up. If I went into environment prods, this should be HTTPS. So if I change that and redeploy, that'll work. Um, but at the same time, I also need to modify the backend to allow this new origin. All right, so run this command. And you can see now that's an allowed origin on the back end. And now you should be able to add a note, right, if I redeployed that production one. But what I wanted to do before that is to make the security headers better. So if we were to go to securityheaders.com and take this URL here and put that in there, you'll see we get an F, right? There's no good security headers that our Angular app is outputting. There's no content security policy. There's no X frame options or anything like that. So let's fix that. And the way you can fix it is using Heroku's static build packs. They allow you to define a static.json like this one that has a content security policy, a refer policy, all those headers it's looking for, as well as turn it so it's HTTPS only. Because what happens right now is if you go to HTTP it'll still work, but you'll notice when we try to log in, it doesn't work. That's because it's using Pixie and auth code flow in the browser. Pixie stands for public uh, key code exchange, and that basically creates a one-time code that's used by your browser to authenticate with Okta. So we wanna make sure it forces HTTPS, and that's what this file will allow us to do. It also configures a spa, right? So it routes everything to index.html. So we'll go ahead and create that in the notes directory static.json and then for it to be read you have to use this Heroku static build pack and because we're using the Heroku static build pack it'll actually use our scripts instead of us having to you know write anything specific like we did with uh, our ng start so um, we want to change this build to use ng build dash dash prod because that's a command it's going to call so we'll go into package.json we'll revert these changes and then we'll make sure that that is the, and then we'll commit our changes to git add the static build pack and push it one more time so now that that's finished let's see if our security headers have improved and they have we're up to an a and then if we were to go and try to use the app we can view the notes let's make sure there's no errors in our console and we can say first note on heroku yes this time it worked, All right? So that's sweet. The next step I wanna do is showing you how to deploy everything with Angular to a number of different providers, Firebase, Amazon, S3, as well as Netlify. And we'll use Angular CLI's ng deploy command for that. But one thing I forgot to do is in my Spring Boot app, I never changed the Spring JPA Hibernate DDL auto. 
What happens right now is if you restart the Spring Boot app, it'll recreate the schema and lose all that data. So let's go ahead and set that. And I'll just make sure it's not set. So Heroku config remote is Heroku. You'll see it's not specified there. So set that Spring JPA Hibernate DDL Auto. And now when it restarts, it actually won't recreate the schema. So that's something that's nice. When you first deploy it, it creates a schema and then you set that property and it won't recreate the schema. So I'm gonna start by creating a Firebase branch make sure we have no changes in here so get check out the firebase and then we'll go to firebase.google.com and i want to log in with my gmail account and go to the console and we'll create a project and i'll call it ng notes and no google analytics Okay, so that finished. And you will need to have the Firebase CLI installed. I already have that installed and configured for my account. Now you can install the ng deploy package for Firebase. That's Angular Fire. So ng add Angular Fire. You have to be in the notes project or in an Angular project to do that. And as long as you're logged in locally in your terminal with the same account that you are through your browser, your new project will show up right here. And they'll create that Firebase JSON, Firebase RC, and update your Angular JSON. And then you can run ng deploy. And unlike Heroku, this isn't based on Git, so you don't have to commit anything. It just takes what's in your actual directory right now. Once your app is available on Firebase, you'll need to make it so your Spring Boot app will allow it in. So grab that URL, make sure we got it. Yep. And we can go, uh, that's not quite as good as I want it. I don't want it to have the... Uh, the line break in there so let's go ahead and just copy it into here there we go so grab that tighten everything back up here and then we can go heroku config edit and the remote is heroku that's where our spring boot app is running and we'll need to modify the allowed origins So that's been updated, it'll restart our app. And then we also need to modify the spa app on Okta, right, to have that URL. So if we were to expand this a bit and go to edit, call back. And now if we were to open it up, click on login, you can see it's working for viewing the notes. And if we were to click on the notes, we should see that one from Heroku come up. There we are. So that's all working. Let's check it with securityheaders.com. Oh, a D, not so good. But you'll notice it does have the strict transport security header. So the beauty of that is if I try to go to HTTP, it redirects me to HTTPS. So at least that header is present by default. So we can configure our security headers in Firebase.json. So we'll go ahead and uh, always add new files to get there. And then we can add a new key called headers. I have a headers Firebase shortcut for that. You'll see it creates a content security policy. Um, it allows connection to Okta and Heroku app. So if you need to do an XHR connection to another uh, endpoint, you'll wanna go ahead and add it there. And then just the rest of the security headers like we did for Heroku. And now we can do ng deploy. Oh, we got an issue on our package.json. So looks like we messed that up there. Run ng deploy again. Let's try it again. Security headers. Now we got an A. Yes. All right. So let's commit those changes. And you'll notice it did add this dot Firebase hosting cache. So I don't know if you need to check that into source control, but if you want to make sure it knows what you deployed last time, I suppose you could. The next thing is deploying to Netlify. So we'll go ahead and get check out the main directory the main branch and create a new one for Netlify. And before running the command to add Netlify support, you need a Netlify account. And I just log in with GitHub and you'll see I already have an account. So you might have to do a little setup there, but um, once you have that, it expects you to be connected to Git. And we want to use ng-deploy rather than, you know, 
connecting to Git. But obviously Git's a good choice because very easy for CI and CD. But I just want to show ng deploy. So the easiest way is to create a temporary directory, put an index.html file in it, and then deploy that. So I already have one of those on my desktop. If you go into the TMP directory here and cap my index.html, it just says hello world. So I'll go ahead and drag and drop that here. And boom, it's deployed, right? That's pretty quick. That's one of the beauties of Netlify. So now we'll need to get an API ID and an access token for the ng deploy plugin for Netlify. The first thing is our site settings has that app ID. So right here, and we'll, uh, we'll just create a new scratch pad. Uh, I don't know, text. And then we need to create a new access token. So that's under user settings, applications, new access token. And we'll just call it Angular. Grab that. And then back to our instructions. We'll go ahead and run ng add Netlify Builder Deploy. Make sure we're in that notes directory. And it'll basically prompt us for these two values, our app ID and our access token. So grab the app ID, paste it in there. I don't know if that worked. The way you can tell if it worked is if you go into angular.json, it actually writes those values into the file. So you'll notice it didn't work. It didn't put those in there. So um, my copy and paste skills aren't working so well. So we can just manually do that. Hopefully your copy and paste skills are better than mine and it works when you do it. And now we can go ahead and run ng deploy. Now if we open up our application on Netlify, we won't be able to log in because we need to add this to our Okta application. So go ahead and edit. Add that. Add it as a logout as well. And then we'll need to add it to our Spring Boot app. So Heroku config, edit, remote is Heroku. Now we should be able to log in. You'll notice what happened here is it actually came back to our app and uh, and gives us a page not found error. Well, that's because Netlify isn't configured to know it's a spa app right now. So we have to configure it so it knows that any request should go to index.html. So to do that, you'll create a redirects file. So under the source directory, go ahead and name it redirects. And then all that you'll have is this one line that says all requests should go to index.html. And then you'll need to modify angular.json to actually include that file. So under the assets here, you can add source redirects, and then we'll run ng deploy again. Now if you were to try again, try from the very beginning, Hmm. Ah, so I figured out the problem. It's listed under test, not the actual deployment. So it should be under build, not test. So fix it in AngularJSON and uh, then do ng deploy again. Now if we try again. This time it'll work and we're logged in. And if we click on view notes, we should see the one from Heroku show up and we can add a new one that says new node from Netlify. All right, so let's check our security header score. Yikes, a D. But we have that strict transport security again, so it will handle the HTTP to HTTPS. To fix security headers, you can create a headers file next to that redirects file. So new file headers. And you'll see it's got all those similar content security policies, all the rest of the security headers, but we also need to add one for HerokuApp.com. And now we can do modify the Angular JSON to include that. Headers and run ng deploy. Now let's test our security headers again. Booyah! We got an A. All right, so now let's commit all that to source control. 
Now I should warn you that this does check in these values, right, for uh, Netlify, and these are not something that you want to put in a public source control setting, even maybe a private one. So this is like a problem with using ng deploy in Netlify. In fact, when I first did this, when I checked it into GitHub, I got warnings, emails that said, hey, you checked in a Netlify API token. So what I like to do is go and delete it after I've demoed it. So we'll go to netlify.com and log in. And I'll go here to user settings and applications and delete that personal access token. And so that way, even if it does get into source control, no one can really use it maliciously. The last platform I'll show you how to deploy to is Amazon's S3. So let's start by checking out master again. Now we'll create a new branch called AWS. And before running the command to deploy to S3, you'll need to create an S3 bucket and have an AWS region name, get a secret access key, and an access key ID. So you'll need an AWS account. I already have one. So if I log into it and go to the S3 console, I can create a new bucket. I'll just call it ng notes. And I'll just accept all the defaults. And then to create a secret access key, you can go to the security credentials page. This is for the IAM and click on access keys and create new access key. And then we'll grab the values from this. And we'll go back to our scratch file here, put them in there. And then you'll add this schematic. And what Amazon allows you to do is actually define all of these as environment variables. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Let's do export access key ID equals this. Oh, it didn't work. Why didn't it work to copy out of my scratch file? Oh, well. we'll just use non environment variables. So add this sucker here. And you add. And ideally use environment variables because then it doesn't get stuck in your angular.json. But this is just a demo, so I'm fine with it getting stuck. And then I'll go ahead and delete those access keys from AWS once I'm done with this. I believe we did US West 1. Let's double check here. Uh, US West 1, Oregon. Yep. And then the bucket name is ng notes. And our ac secret access key is this. Let's make sure we can paste it somewhere else. Okay. Ah, didn't get in there. I know it didn't go in there. Oh well. We'll try the access key ID. And then just use the default. So put it on Angular JSON. And if I go into Angular JSON at the bottom, it's got those missing values again. So I'll paste them in there, access key ID. And now we can run ng deploy. And once it's finished uploading your files, you'll need to enable static website hosting. So you can go here, go to properties, static web hosting, and we'll use this bucket to host a website. You're gonna need this URL, so let's grab that for later. And we'll specify an index document of index.html and errors index.html as well, so that will handle it being a spa. And we can save it. And then we'll also need to change the permissions so we're not blocking all public access. So under permissions, edit. And when you're creating it, you could have done this as well. I just wanted to accept all the defaults. And then you'll also need a bucket policy. ng notes or whatever your bucket name is all right so now we should be able to go to this url and it'll render our site but it's http not https so if we were to try and even click on login it wouldn't allow us to right so to use https with s3 what i found is the best solution is cloudfront so you can open up a cloudfront console here and we'll go ahead and create a distribution a web distribution and if you click here, it'll bring up your S3 bucket. So click in the origin domain name, bring up your S3 bucket. Uh, viewer protocol policy, redirect HTTP to HTTPS. And then you'll also need to set the default root object down at the bottom here to index.html. And then scroll down and click create distribution. And so this can take some time to run. I've even seen it take up to 20 minutes to deploy. So what you'll want to do is uh, expand your browser so you can see the status. 
refresh because that table tries to be responsive and you'll see it's in progress. So when that changes from in progress to not in progress, then it should be available at this domain name here. So that domain name is cloudfront.net. So we can start adding this to our various Okta and Heroku configurations. So we'll go into Okta here. And you do have to add HTTPS and callback. And then we'll update Spring Boot as well. So let's, uh, let's grab that full URL, HTTPS, and Heroku config edit. So you can see that's finished deploying. We can grab that URL, try it out. And now if we click login, it looks like it does a different URL than the one. So you notice how it redirected me to ng notes. So after waiting for 20 minutes and still having that redirect problem, I figured out what I needed to change. The distribution settings point to that S3 bucket but it should really point to the URL rather than the bucket. So I'm gonna go ahead and just create a new one. So create a new distribution, get started. And then instead of selecting that S3 bucket, we actually want the URL and you'll put that in there, not the actual S3 bucket. And then the redirect HTTP to HTTPS and the index.html is the default root object and create a distribution. So we wanna delete our old one. And then for the new one, that's the URL we'll want to add everywhere. So we just have that value there. You can go to Okta. And change that. Change that. And then now we'll wait, you know, five, ten minutes, whatever it takes for that new distribution to deploy. That's finished deploying. Let's try it. Woohoo! It works. So now we should be able to log in. And looky there. Talking Heroku, yep. And we can even create a new one. AWS note. It works. Okay, so if we were to take this and try security headers, we get an F. So this is something that is a little more difficult to configure on AWS than it is on Netlify or Firebase. You have to actually use a Lambda console and create a Lambda function that adds the security headers after the response processes. So we'll go to the Lambda console here. The one thing that I've noticed is you do need to specify a specific region. So US East 1N, so US East and then it looks like I have one here, so let's delete that and create a new one and name it security headers. Click create under permissions from AWS policy templates. Enter a name, so we'll call this security headers role and we'll do basic a Lambda edge permissions for cloud tr front trigger and click create function. And then in the function code section right here, we'll need to change that index.js to have this code in it. And that sets all the content security policy headers. All right, and then save it. Select CloudFront as a trigger. And deploy to Lambda Edge. And so that's our distribution. And then origin response. And I acknowledge and deploy. Okay, and if we go back to our CloudFront console, all right, it's in progress, or no, that one's in progress. We should see that BA1 is in progress, so yeah. I chose the wrong distribution because I had that other one in there. So once that completes, then we should get better security headers. Let's try scanning for security headers again. Hmm. And deploy. Hmm, still got the last function in there because I wasn't able to delete it. Well, maybe it works now. No such luck. Darn it. Well, it worked the first time I did it, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that AWS and Lambda Edge is much harder to add security headers than with Netlify and Heroku. 
and the others. But, you know, this should work. I'm sure if you choose the proper distribution the first time, unlike I did, then you'll have much better success. So you can commit, you know, your code. Nothing really, as far as the headers, was configured in the code, so not a big deal. We can just say commit the AWS3 deployment. And then you'll want to go ahead and delete your access key and delete that one because in case you check that angular json into source control you don't want that to be exposed so thank you for watching this video and uh, if you want to check out the blog post that's angular deployment with the site of spring boot and the github repo is that octa developer octa angular deployment example so I hope you enjoyed this. If you like this video, you can follow my team on Twitter at Octodev. You can follow me on Twitter at MRabel. And we publish videos like this one to our Octodev YouTube channel. Chances are you're watching it right now on there. So make sure and subscribe and have a great day.